In order to do politics well, you actually need to have devoted a whole bunch of time and concentrated effort upon things that are worth knowing whether they're involved in politics or not. In other words, a, the liberal education I was talking about earlier, uh, which pursues knowledge for its own sake, is an essential antecedent to good and thoroughly humane politics. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo and Johnny. Today we are joined by Dr. David Whalen, Vice President for Curriculum and longtime English professor at Hillsdale College, as well as a former ISI Weaver Fellow, to discuss literature, its intersection with the political, G.K. Chesterton's metaphysical realism and wonder. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Whalen. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Before we get started with our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Dr. Whalen, you actually recently joined us in Wilmington, Delaware for our homecoming a few weeks ago, and uh, you appeared on a panel to discuss the telos of the university. So perhaps that's a good place to start, um, given, you know, the, the kind of thrust of our podcast here. So from the perspective of an English professor, and especially one at Hillsdale, and who has taught at Hillsdale for uh, quite some time, how would you describe that for our listeners who perhaps weren't able to make it to the panel? First of all, it's, that was a great event. Um, the ISI homecoming was, was uh, despite uh, some forbidding weather, it, it, it came off beautifully, I thought. So it, it was a great event, and I certainly enjoyed meeting everyone there and, and speaking on the topic of, of liberal education. It, w when people, it's such a big topic, it's kind of hard to get it in a nutshell, you know. Uh, but when people ask, what is the telos? What is the, what is the purpose of a liberal education? You, you could, I think, fairly boil it down to two things. Essentially, a liberal education is for humanizing. It's about humanizing the human being. Okay. It's humanizing the human person. Now that just sounds kind of crazy on the face of it, right? I mean, if it's a human person, you, you don't need to dog eyes the dog or cat eyes the cat. You know, why would you have to humanize the human being? And, and the answer is, we're very strange people, or we're very strange beings. Uh, we actually have to learn to see the world as it is. It's, it's hard for us to actually see reality clearly, certainly very hard to understand it. But secondly, uh, it is through that learning about the world, about reality, that we become fully human. We actually humanize ourselves by by exercising our intelligence in the uh, pursuit of knowledge, in the grasp of understanding, we actually become more fully human. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of shorthand for what it means to humanize the human being. But it's not just that; it really is a twofold telos that a liberal education uh, has, and the, the the second portion of that telos is kind of like the first. It it, it, that, that is, a liberal education civilizes society. <laughs> okay, so it does something for an individual person. It humanizes a human being. But then it also turns around and does something for a culture. It civilizes a society. Uh, and again, uh, you might say, well, wait a minute. Society, civilization, aren't those convertible terms? I mean, are, are, isn't it all the same? And the answer is no, not at all. I think when I was back there uh, uh, at ISI in, in Delaware, I read this short little passage uh, from John Henry Newman, the great theorist of liberal education, uh, precisely about a uh, uh, liberal arts education's uh, effect on its culture. And he, he puts it this way. He says that the, a liberal arts, he uses the term university, but he means traditionally a liberal arts university. Training is the great ordinary means to a great but ordinary end. It aims at raising the intellectual tone of society, at cultivating the public mind, at purifying the national taste, at supplying true principles to popular enthusiasm and fixed aims to popular aspiration, at giving enlargement and sobriety to the ideas of the age, 
at facilitating the exercise of political power and refining the intercourse of private life. Now that that that's a lot. You you could write a book unpacking that passage, but essentially what he's talking about is the kind of thing you see reference when people talk about a liberal education handing on a patrimony or passing on a heritage um, or or perpetuating a civilization's self-understanding and a civilization's um, a set of standards for excellence and for probity. So, so, um, so really, I would say the telos of, of higher learning is this twofold, two directioned, so to speak, um, um, uh, purpose. Humanizing the human being, civilizing the society. And the, the, the last thing I should say about that is both of these, these aren't this isn't icing on some kind of a cake. This isn't, you know, a uh, decoration. This isn't, we're not talking about finishing school. Uh, 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 both of these purposes are hardwired, are built into human nature. In other words, liberal education suffers many, what we might call existential threats in our time. But the good news is fundamentally liberal education answers to human nature and human nature isn't going away. So, so liberal education may contract or may be diminished in a particular era, but it, it really is a response to permanent desires and promptings in the human soul. So, so it, it, it answers to human nature and therefore it really can't ever disappear entirely. That was be beautifully put, uh, Dr. Whalen. I'm curious. One other thing that you mentioned on the panel was the, the role of wonder yes. in this humanizing and civilizing effort. And I'm wondering if you could briefly define wonder and expand upon the, the role of the role of that. Right. Well, wonder wonder is one of those words that's suffered a lot from misuse. Uh, we say, I wonder what we're having for lunch. You know, I, I wonder if there's any mustard in the refrigerator. Uh, it's often confused, for instance, with something like curiosity. But properly speaking, wonder is a species of fear. Oddly enough, perhaps that sounds strange, but it's, it's traditionally understood as fear of our own ignorance. That is, uh, when we wonder at something, uh, we are, uh, met with, uh, something we don't fully grasp or understand, something that exceeds our comprehension. And that, that, that sense of awe or wonder is a kind of combination of, uh, uh, the desire to know, the recognition that we don't know, and, uh, the acknowledgement that we're in the presence of something compelling and great. So, um, just naturally speaking, you, you, uh, a classic example I remember that was used in explaining this to me when I was much younger. If you imagine taking some, some young, um, uh, some some kid who's only known city life take take him way out into the middle of the countryside in the in the middle of the night where there's no light pollution at all and he looks up at the sky and sees the Milky Way for the for actually the Milky Way without a telescope for the first time that that emotion that you can readily imagine that's that's perfectly typical of the passion of wonder and interestingly enough um, this is traditionally regarded as the birthplace wonder that that passion of wonder is regarded as the birthplace of poetry and philosophy both um now i could talk about that forever and i won't bore you uh, uh, with it but the but the, the point is all serious attempts to engage and understand reality in all its three dimensional complexity begin actually in wonder. And so you might say liberal education itself depends on wonder. And one of the things that I think a, uh, a professor at the um, uh, post-secondary level or a teacher in the K through 12 level has to do is to cultivate this passion of wonder, this, this, this desire uh, rooted in a kind of pleasant sort of fear, oxymoronic as that may sound, uh, uh, they, uh, the teachers have to cultivate a, a genuine desire to know, not curiosity, not just the, ooh, um, I want to pry into things that are none of my business, but rather um, a, a recognition that there's an intelligible world out there 
and I know so little about it. I want to, I want to understand it more. Maybe that just sounds too nerdy and eggheaded, but, but wonder really is the root of all human um, uh, attempts to understand the world. I was reading a book about, um, I think it's the unseriousness of American affairs by Father James Shaw, right. um, where he distinguishes between this wonder and curiosity because Lucifer was curious, right? And um, <laughs> it, it was just such a fascinating uh, kind of distinction that he makes between these two these two different um, senses. And it really drew me to kind of consider, you know, how do we approach the, you know, the just the sheer the sheer volume of the unknown without falling into, you know, habitual uh, sin or degeneracy. So I'm curious what your, what your thoughts on that distinction is between wonder and, and curiosity that may actually lead us astray. Right. No, that's a great question. And on, on, on one level, on one level, it, it can be a more verbal distinction rather than a real one. And that is a lot of times people, mean something. They'll use the word curiosity, but they, they actually mean it in an innocent way. They mean something more uh, uh, traditionally understood as wonder. Or sometimes people will use the word wonder when in, in a way that really would be uh, understood as uh, representing something more like curiosity. So sometimes, I mean, there's some fluidity in, in usage and, and I don't get, I, I don't get too caught up in, put it this way, I, I don't correct people if they say, well, I'm curious about such and so. And I, I, I don't say, no, you're not curious. You're wondering about that, you know, but in, when you go past the verbal sort of fluidity of usage, uh, and go into the traditional understandings, curiosity is, is a desire, an inordinate, it's an, a disordered desire to to interfere with things that do not actually um, to go where we don't belong. To interfere, uh, sometimes it's called forbidden knowledge or something like that. It doesn't have to be some grandiose Faustian sort of uh, forbidden cosmic knowledge, but it, it can be the desire to know. Usually, in order to um, uh, either achieve some kind of personal superiority or some manipulative power fundamentally and this is this is kind of the nasty bit fundamentally curiosity is a desire an inordinate desire for power it's it's a it's a kind of species of pride right uh, whereas wonder maintains a subordinate posture with respect to the thing wondered about so i may wonder about the milky way but I know that it is a very great thing, and in certain ways, very obvious and immediate ways, much, much greater than I can ever be, or even than I could even understand. Um, this isn't false humility. You know, we're not talking about everybody, you know, uh, uh, rolling around saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. <laughs> it's rather, um, it, there's a respectful and, and appreciative posture in wonder toward this great and as yet mysterious thing that we're wondering about. So I, I guess I would say at heart, in reality, you get past the verbal fluidity. The distinction between wonder and curiosity is uh, the desire to know in order to manipulate and control or to um, master, achieve a kind of superiority over something, or the a kind of deferential and respectful admiration uh, for something about which we would be grateful rather than desiring to dominate. Dr. Whalen, um, shifting gears a little bit, you know, there, since, especially since, you know, going back to the 1960s, there've been a lot of uh, battles over the curriculum and what constitutes the canon uh, that students ought to learn at it at the university. And I was curious uh, your opinion on, uh, I'm not sure if you've re read the piece, but there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last weekend by a UVA sociologist named Angel Parham, who has a new book with Anika Prather on the Black intellectual tradition. And she argues that conserv or that universities shouldn't cancel the classics, but expand upon them, saying that excellence and diversity can coexist uh, with an education in the classics. And so I'm curious what you make of this appeal of hers to perhaps not cancel the classics, but expand it to highlight uh, maybe voices that had been underemphasized or perhaps drawing in some new, you know, perspectives into the canon itself. And how, how do you think about that at Hillsdale as well? Right, right. Well, the, the um, first of all, no, I'm, I'm afraid I hadn't read the article, so I, I'm not familiar with it. 
But a, a couple of thoughts come to mind uh, f- right away. First of all, one of the properties, and this is an this is not an original observation. This is you know old hat. A lot of people have known this for, and talked about it for a long, long time. So I can't take credit for it. But one of the fundamental qualities of the Western intellectual and cultural tradition is an assimilative power. That is a, a, a boat, not just a capacity or ability to assimilate, to absorb great um, uh, creations, understandings, achievements, uh, uh, not just the ability to do that, but the desire to do that. That is, uh, the, if you think about the Western cultural and classical tradition, uh, I, I think I mentioned this back in Delaware. Um, looked at in one way, it's kind of a glorious mess, you know, <laughs> and by mess, I mean, it's not this univocal, monolithic, um, single stream of meaning. There, there are lots of arguments. There are voices that are in contention with each other all the time. I was just drawing up a reading list for a, a class I'll be teaching here in the fall, and I was in- making sure to include the Roman poet Lucretius, who's a Hardcore materialist, you know, he's denying all the formless and all the, uh, uh, the religious, uh, uh, thinkers and figures of his day and, and preceding eras. So, so you, you've got, you've got, um, the, the West is full of these different takes. There are some consistent themes. I'm not saying it's just, it's nothing but a mess. Uh, there are some, uh, fairly consistent themes. And one of those consistent themes is a desire for truth wherever it may be found. And I think that's the bedrock uh, principle behind arguments such as the one you you note uh, for expanding the canon. I, I worry about artificial attempts to expand quote unquote canons. I don't even like the term canon, but I, I get it. You've got to use it, you know, for convenience sake. But um, it suggests a degree of a deliberate and arbitrary control over things. And that's not actually how the Western tradition has worked. It's been much more organic. It's been much less prescriptive. And in that organic, assimilative, hungry fashion that the West has for absorbing into the, 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 um, in the heritage of wisdom to be passed on to future generations, that organic capacity and desire is not to be underestimated. And I think that will do exactly what uh, this writer you you note uh, uh, suggests it will it will um, uh, reach out into all the different spheres and 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 uh, genres and races and ethnicities and pull in greatness where it, sometimes it takes a couple hundred years to to for that to happen or for that it's often not instantaneous. But but it does happen. In fact, the whole Western tradition is the story of that happening over and over and over again. And so ultimately, I guess you'd say I'm pretty optimistic that what she uh, advocates does indeed and will indeed occur. I worry that it's actually cheapened and made a little less uh, valuable, a little more arbitrary just by a kind of checklist of of backgrounds or voices or ethnicities or something like that. You know, if you do it that way, you, you lose some of that organic authenticity, but, but it does happen. On that note, um, and this is kind of being drawn from my own experience in a, a college uh, English and, and poetry department where some of, there was that checklist in many cases of the, of the literature that we ended up reading. But um, I'm curious what you think literature's intersection with the political is, because there are many great works that are apparently political. Um, many of them are, you know, Shakespeare's. So if we're talking about Western canon, uh, Shakespeare, you know, uh, had political themes throughout his work. But I think a common complaint from conservatives is that art itself and um, including literature has become too political. And perhaps we're, and you know, in the progressive or leftist sense, and perhaps we're thinking of politics in a very narrow way here. So I'm curious, you know, how do you make sense of how literature is put into contact with the political? Oh, that's very good. That's very good. I I have a lot of sympathy uh, with with people who are a little impatient uh, with the rather narrow and ideologically politicized arts of of our own day. The um, the, the two things are true, and they sound like they ought to be mutually exclusive, but but they're they're both true. One is that 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 art is um, and certainly literature is immensely politically relevant and revealing 
But at the same time, it ceases to become so, or at least becomes so in, a, a, in, an, in an inferior way when it aims at being political. <laughs> it's a it's a paradox, but but and and I'm I'm, I'm being eh, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush. Okay, so I'm not speaking with a great deal of precision. But what what what, what does this mean? Well, what art, what literature does is it, it unfolds, it unfolds human nature um, in front of us, you know, before our very eyes. It kind of, uh, uh, it, it so, sort of um, fast forwards the blossoming of human nature set in concrete circumstances, okay? And so you see in literature a kind of the, the, the whole world at play. You see how things work. There's a, a, a great line, of course, uh, speaking of literature, King Lear, I, I, I love to make this, cite this, this brief passage where he, he, uh, meets the blinded Gloucester on the heath and he, he says to him, um, uh, you have no eyes in your head. Uh, uh, and yet he says, you see how the, wor- how this world goes. And Gloucester replies, I, I see it feelingly. Punning, of course, on his being blind. So he has to sort of grope his way, but it means more than just groping his way through the world. It means he sees how the world goes with a kind of deep and profound and even emotional connection, uh, to that, to that proceeding of, of, of human life in our, uh, troubled concrete circumstances. So what I'm saying is that, that, um, that's what literature does. It unfolds how the world goes before us. And that is, you know, that includes lots of things such as politics. It's not the only thing. Uh, it's not even the chief thing, but it certainly includes man's social and political nature, both narrowly and broadly speaking. When it often happens, though, well, there's a great line by the poet John Keats. He says somewhere, I think it's in one of his letters. He says, we hate poetry that has designs upon us. <laughs> so the funny thing that happens when, when if, 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 if literature relegates the unfolding of human nature in front of us to a second place status and puts in first place an agenda, an ideological agenda, then the art suffers. It's actually lousy art. It actually, it, 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 it turns out even if the agenda is an admirable and noble and lofty agenda, uh, the, the, the art tends to suffer. Uh, I'm not saying that, that, um, um, people shouldn't have good or moral or noble purposes when they write. But if, if the writing isn't first and foremost about telling a good tale or, or composing a good poem in which this complex human nature is unfolded, then, then, uh, um, what you've got is a subordination of art to politics and it becomes, it becomes a form of dressed up propaganda rather than real literature. Dr. Whalen expanding kind of on the question of, of the political sphere. I'm curious, how, how do you think organizations or institutions of, of education like Hillsdale, uh, like ISI, ought to engage with politics. Um, I ask that because, in, in, you know, in one sense, liberal learning is done, or, or many people say it, it ought to be done for its own sake. I think back to my own time at Hillsdale, I, I basically unplugged from politics for four years and just sort of discovered the glories of, you know, great literature and, and great philosophy and theology. But, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, students, uh, alums of Hillsdale, a lot of alums of ISI who are engaged at the highest levels of American politics. And, you know, I, of course, think that's a, a wonderful thing. But there are some critics who have said, you know, that that sort of undermines or perhaps subverts that kind of core educational purpose of liberal learning. At Hillsdale, I know, and perhaps some people have said the same thing about ISI. So how do you I don't know, because in one sense, you can't, how do you balance those views? How do you think about that engagement or relationship? Right. Well, th- there are a couple ways of coming at it. For, first of all, there is a kind of fallacy of false opposition between uh, learning a bunch of things that are good for their own sake, learning things that are good, true, and beautiful, good to know just for their own sake, and the practical, active life of the busy uh, world of human affairs, uh, politics, for instance. 
It turns out that those two aren't opposed to each other at all. In order to do politics well, you actually need uh, to have devoted a whole bunch of time and concentrated effort upon things that are worth knowing whether they're involved in politics or not. In other words, a, the, the, the liberal education I was talking about earlier, uh, which pursues knowledge for its own sake, um, is an essential antecedent to good and, and, and thoroughly humane politics. Okay. And in fact, it, it, it's when I say a necessary antecedent, I don't mean, again, that it's just sweet and nice and decorative and pretty and aw shucks. I, I mean, your politics, look, we're human beings. We're fallible and flawed uh, uh, pretty much to the ground, right? So it's really hard to get politics right to begin with. But you have no hope of doing that at all if you don't have um, a, a, a cult an educated um, um, demographic that is in love with the good, the true, and the beautiful. It, 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 you're not going to get politics right, except maybe by some weird accident, and that would be very short-lived, uh, unless you have a significant and um, influential uh, order of people who spent formative years um, structuring and habituating their minds and imaginations to the good, the true, and the beautiful. I know that maybe that phrase is overused, uh, but but it has the advantage of of recognizing that there is some, there are true things to be known and that are worth knowing for their own sake, and those have an effect on the human character uh, and and render it uh, more more morally and ethically noble and. All of these things, too, are seen in a dimension of radiant, illuminating beauty. So these, the good and the true and the beautiful, may be thrown around a lot, but but um, it is so for good reason. So anyway, just to summarize, the 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 the, the sort of consequence-free immersion in studying the highest things, uh, such as the the curriculum, uh, uh, the core here at Hillsdale is dedicated to that. That isn't um, to diminish or disparage politics at all. What it is is a recognition of a kind of chronological priority. You need to form the mind and the heart in a certain way in these goods for their own sake before you let that animal loose, <laughs> so to speak, into the world of adults, adult people, uh, to, to make their way in a political order. Um, you, you, if you, if you, if you push them out into that world without that formation, well, then you get a kind of cheapened politics where everything is ideology. Actually, as you know, just to, just to make a, a brief a parenthetical point, we live in a world where most people think everything is all ideology all the time. And the only question is, is it your flavor of ideology or my flavor of ideology? That's a perfect, perfect example of a puerile, childish mistake. OK, and people, sometimes very smart people, sometimes even quote unquote educated people will say that. But it actually is uh, it betrays a profound poverty of their intellectual and moral formation. The reason uh, we have so much of that today is because we have so little actual education. Once more people are properly educated in the way that I've been describing, you'll see less and less of that everything is all ideology all the time, and you'll see people actually entering into genuine deliberation about the human good and, and how to get there. I don't mean to throw around the good and true and beautiful phrase once again, but I will for the purpose of this question, um, which is, you know, literature, literature and the humanities are often the gateways for discovering the good, the true and the beautiful. And this, you know, this not impoverished education that you're referring to. And oftentimes it is these are the foremost gateways for students becoming enchanted with liberal learning. And at ISI alone, you know, there are countless examples. I'm sure you as an English professor at Hillsdale, you probably encountered this as well. Um, but, you know, there have been so many ISI students who, in many cases, develop this new, like, metaphysical, but also temporal insight and um, into, you know, just this ability to do this introspection that they wouldn't have perhaps been able to otherwise um, after reading a book like Brideshead Revisited, just as an example. And that's, that's a common one that I come across, especially. 
Um, so I'm curious, you know, what books do you think are the most capable of the, these types of revelations, um, this type of, uh, you know, a pipeline to this type of introspection and, and the good, the true and the beautiful? Um, and so if you could name a few books there, but also do you think college English programs are successfully inspiring these types of these types of encounters? in the way that, you know, Hillsdale or ISI seem to be? <laughs> let, me, let me address the, the second question first. No. <laughs> the answer is no. A lot of college literature programs are inspiring a headlong, rapid, screaming flight from anything literary, artistic, or humane. <laughs> I mean, the, the, um, it is no secret that, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, a few places, of course, uh, happily Hillsdale is one of them, but there are a few places that, that are, are inspiring or do offer kind of inspiring literary uh, programs at the post-secondary level. But by and large, most of them are, are in a process of a slow suicide. Uh, that, that is, the humanities in general seem to be committing suicide all, all around us. Um, so I'm afraid rather than inspirational, most college literature programs are, I don't know what the opposite of inspiration is, but whatever it is, it's the opposite. You know, they, 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 um, they seem to fill people with a desire to leave literature behind or more, perhaps more to the point, um, they seem to to denature literature and turn literature, as I said a few minutes ago, into a kind of ideological propaganda. Um, uh, literature as such really isn't even taught much anymore. Uh, literature is grist to the mill of politics. That is, literature is a means to the end of, of making some kind of political or theoretical uh, uh, po or, uh, observation or, or set of points. So literature as literature is almost non-existent today. It, it's always in the service of this other thing. Um, but to come back to, to what's really the root of your question and to be a little less pessimistic, perhaps, um, um, th this may sound like a dodge. I don't, I really don't mean it to be a dodge. I will mention some books, uh, but frankly, almost any serious uh, literature, any serious book or poem, if it's taught well, doesn't even have to be taught. I recognize that. But we're, I'm thinking of an educational context. Almost any serious book can, um, um, inspire in the way that you described. Uh, if it's, if it's taught well, what you, what you want is you, you want that experience where the student says, with a kind of wonder, uh, putting the book down, Oh my gosh, that changes everything. That just that just changes everything, and I've seen that happen um, with with many texts. You know, if, if I, I can I can point out several um, um, something like uh, something like Shakespeare's King Lear. I mentioned that just a few moments ago. That that is a play. Of course, Shakespeare is great. Everybody knows that. But I think actually Shakespeare suffers from his own great, greatness. People are afraid of Shakespeare. They think, oh, Shakespeare, I have to sit up straight in my chair and put on a tie and, and get up my dictionary and this is going to be really hard. Okay, okay. Well, you have to get past all that. Uh, so pretend you've never even heard of Shakespeare and just read the play, um, uh, slowly and attentively and you'll put it down saying, oh my gosh, this changes everything. The play is so sublime. The work is so mag, if one talk about unfolding human nature, um, it is a profound meditation on such a number of profound human realities that it, it beggars the imagination. How could you even do all of that in one play? So that, that, that would be an example. Uh, another one, picking Shakespeare again, would be on, on the other end, uh, comedy instead of tragedy. Something like Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, it's a romp. Yes, it's a thigh slapping, laugh out loud comedy. Um, uh, but it is also a profoundly Gloriously and happily, uh, a humane meditation on, on our, on the proximity, on many things, but on the proximity of what makes us, what's glorious about being human and what's utterly laughable and ridiculous about being human. Those two are so closely intertwined that <laughs> Shakespeare loves to think about that. But you know, um, um, other books, the, 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 it's sometimes surprising. I know, 
I know a young man who, who of all things was kind of awakened to this, the glorious possibilities of, um, uh, sort of life changing literature by Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. That's an 18th century comic, kind of an epic comic novel that is wild and, and nobody thinks of it as serious literature. They just think of it as a, a great comic romp. And yet, and yet, it is actually quite serious and uh, um, uh, beautifully done to boot. And that actually had a profound effect on that young man and, and moved him in far, very far down the road of uh, literature as a, a glorious lifelong pursuit. Um, um, some it, A lot depends on the temperament of the student, the person you're talking about. A novel may do it for one person. It may be poetry for another one. So frankly, um, Someone who's well known at ISI, uh, the, the, the T.S. Eliot, the poetry of T.S. Eliot often has the effect of grabbing someone by their lapels and shaking them awake. You know, they, they, they first encounter the wasteland or, or proof rock or something and they say, this is gobbledygook. What the heck is going on? But they have the sense that, wait a minute, something, something is just behind the surface here. And when they start to see what really is going on, they're entranced and, and, and their, their, their lives are, are changed. So, so in fact, um, again, I'm not trying to be evasive or, or, or say, um, this, it, it, just any book will do. It has to be serious, but I think much depends on if it's well taught. And one of the principles of, the, of that teaching I alluded to earlier, and that is a, um, instead of encouraging students to become curious masters, so to speak, of what they know, subjecting it to their, um, you know, analytic um, um, uh, um, acuity of mind. If, if we all approach this great text, whatever it is, in, with a sense of wonder and admiration, as if it has something to teach us rather than I have something to practice on it, then, then we'll all do a lot better. I can mention some other texts if you want to. There's a, uh, I could wish this, I've taught this, but I don't think it's taught very often. There's a contemporary novelist named Mark Helprin. Uh, he's got a kind of an epic novel called A Soldier of the Great War. That is a fantastic novel. That, that'll, if that doesn't knock your socks off, it's because you're not wearing socks. Um, it's, it's just, it's just terrific. I also find the novels of Walker Percy. Um, very impressive. He's, he's not, um, overtly, well, some of his not, some of his later novels are more overtly political, but, but he's exploring modern consciousness and some of the twists, labyrinthine twists and turns in the modern psyche. Um, he's, he's very good. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, um, it's nonfiction. Uh, that is, perhaps this is straying a little far from the literary field, but, if I think a student is just on the verge of becoming a serious student, and by serious, I don't mean grim. I, I simply mean they didn't really think they were interested in the, the, the life of the mind and the good and the true and the beautiful. They thought they were just getting a degree to get their, their ticket stamped. But suddenly they're on the verge of, wow, there's really cool stuff, important stuff that I should be paying attention to. I'll give them Joseph Pieper's Leisure, The Basis of Culture. I know that's not a literary text, but it's so good. I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe I'll decide it is literature. It's so, it's so, um, exquisitely and concisely revelatory. It's a, it's a great little book. It's funny you mentioned Pieper. I, um, my husband, he studied philosophy at Penn. And so he was, he wanted to be a philosophy professor, but, and he's very interested in, in Catholic, you know, I mean, he's, he, I think he'd consider himself a Thomist, but he, he had not been familiar with Pieper. And um, I love Pieper and um, I recommended Pieper to him. So he recently picked up uh, that text as well as the four cardinal virtues. And I've, you know, just a number of um, ISI professors and faculty that I have encountered that have uh, mentioned Pieper. Pieper was like very uh, heartening to me that he's kind of like this well-known secret that hopefully more people will be exposed to, but I'm happy you mentioned him as well. No, he's, Pieper is amazing. Uh, I, I don't know how you can be so luminously clear and concise and profound at the same time. Most of us, the deeper we get, the more verbiage we generate, you know, with Pieper, the deeper he gets, the clearer he becomes. He's really something. 
Well, I think we have time for one more question, which is the one that we ask all of our guests before we wrap up for the episode. So Dr. Whalen, um, I want to ask you what, how you would define conservatism. <laughs> Beats the heck out of me. The, the, uh, that would be a very conservative definition of conservatism. It, it beats me. I, I guess, see, now this, I'm going to do something very nerdy and academic, and I'm, and so I apologize in advance. Uh, I guess I want to make a distinction between the conservatism as a descriptor of contemporary political, cultural movements and trends and conservatism as something a little bit more permanent, something a little bit less subject to change. Um, the, the, I, I think the movements and trends in political and cultural um, dispositions and, and objects is very, very fluid and, and, and would require a kind of an, not just an acuity of mind, but an awareness of, of those movements and trends beyond my own. Um, but, but what, what might be considered conservative of a more permanent or uh, enduring or durable sort of uh, nature, and that is uh, a a disposition of. See, you're going to think I'm just repeating myself. I, I think conservatism could be described as a habitual disposition uh, uh, toward um, uh, or to regard the world and its past with with gratitude and admiration. Okay, rather than disdain or neglect okay it's not a fast when i say the world and the past i do mean the present and the past i i, I don't mean just the past uh, certainly conservatism is not obsession with the past certainly it isn't um uh, blinded uh, or blinkered by the past but but you've got to regard the world that you've been born into with its accumulated history as a gift as something to be um, appreciated, and that doesn't uh, something to be appreciated and and grateful for, something to wonder at, um, rather than um, something to um, revolutionize or something to simply tip over and 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 upset and and um, um, modify according to your own momentary whims. There, there's a um, um, that this is not at all to acknowledge that the world we were born into is always and everywhere and has always has been a mess and needs lots of correction and fixing. And, you know, there, there is work to be done. We, we're not born simply to sit here uh, in, you know, some sort of cross-legged lotus fashion and say, um, you know, um, uh, no, we're here to uh, get busy and, and uh, make things as best we can and, and to fix things insofar as they're fixable, et cetera. I get all that. I, I understand. But I said a habitual disposition, okay, a habitual disposition of respect, admiration, and gratitude for the world and the past. That's a kind of conservative um, uh, posture. I was reading uh, recently, um, uh, there's a kind of autobiographical essay by uh, the, the philosopher, um, your husband probably uh, uh, knows of him, um, um, Jacques Maritain, a 20th century Thomas. Uh, he's, he has a book written late in life called A Peasant of the Garonne. And uh, again, it's a kind of autobiographical essay. And he, he mentions there uh, he, 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 whether rightly or wrongly, I, I tend to think he's right, but he says people fall into temperamentally, people tend to fall into two camps, you know, uh, um, and he's not going to speak in terms of the four classic temperaments. He, he's thinking more simply. And he said they, they either have a conservative or a liberal kind of bias. And, and he doesn't mean that narrowly politically. He says a conservative bias is somebody who has a horror of disorder and, and a love for order. Whereas a liberal bias, he says, is somebody who has a, a horror of anything flawed or um, um, anything, anything suboptimal, anything flawed. 
So the liberal will always incline towards a kind of reforming agitation and restlessness and dissatisfaction with the status quo, whereas a conservative temperament will be a little bit more prone to um, um, fear the kind of chaos and disorder that can come through those reforming efforts. I, I think I think that's an oversimplification in a lot of ways. Um, but one way in which I think that's help that can be helpful is in underscoring a, a conservative disposition might be inclined not I think by toward a fear of anything, but rather an admiration and and gratitude for for what is ordered in the world and for what is good in the world and for uh, what what has been achieved historically. Uh, rather than just a contemptuous disdain or dissatisfaction. Dr. Rowan, I think that's a, a perfect note to end our show today. Thank you so much for joining. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? <laughs> well, they, 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 they can find me. I suppose, I suppose you, um, you can Google my name. I suppose, uh, I don't have my own website. I'm not, I'm not much into self promotion, but I do know that there are some videos online that you can look up and see there. I am, uh, most prolific in speaking engagements rather than publishing engagements. So there's probably more there to be seen than to be read, but I do have some publications that you can find again, simply by Googling my name and, and uh, bump into them that way. Great. Uh, thanks for joining us, David. It's my pleasure, Johnny, and uh, uh, bully for you all and all the good work you do. Thank you, Dr. Whalen. And thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel, feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Seth Modern Age articles, ISI books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.